So we covered 9-11 two weeks ago with United 93, and we've kind of touched on a little bit in the war in Afghanistan that followed with the United States retaliating against Al-Qaeda that was seeking shelter with the Taliban. And again, we didn't really go into a lot of detail on that. And then today with the Hurt Locker, we're getting into the war in Iraq that followed. And while not directly related to 9-11... Despite what we were told at the time, we did end right. up basically deciding that what was best to protect American interests and to help fight the war on terror was to initiate regime change in Iraq. Yeah, and I don't, I don't remember if I brought this up on the record or if it was when we were talking after when we were doing United 93, but I asked if you had ever seen the miniseries or read the book The Looming Tower. I have not. So at the, at the end of that miniseries, I want to say it's either like on 9-11 or like shortly thereafter that uh, it's a conversation between uh, what someone on like the National Security Council. And I think it's Condoleezza Rice about, oh, we need to we need to try and tie this to Iraq. And the guy's like, no, like we know who did it. It was Osama bin Laden. Like we've been working it for, you know, almost 10 years now. Like it was Osama bin Laden. She's like, well, we want to we want to try and tie this to Iraq. And he's, you know, trying to tell her, like, no, we we know who did it. They're not, you know, Iraq isn't involved. It's Al Qaeda. It's this terrorist group. And they're like, well, be that as it may. Right. And I, it's so, so frustrating because both parties signed up for this. And at the time, I wasn't alone in being utterly unconvinced that the so-called evidence was just not convincing. It seems so soft and... I remember thinking it was like taking crazy, but like I supported going into Afghanistan to go after Al Qaeda. But when then when it shifted mm-hmm. to Iraq, I just wasn't buying it from the beginning, and it just there was no. Right. It just seemed like a con job. And then when the Democrats were signing up on up for it too, I was just like thought I was in the twilight zone. I was like, I, and I basically was like trying to say I probably even wrote it down somewhere and saved the file. That like no, seriously, this is the wrong call. Yeah, I mean, because I, I was I was only 10 years old, so I didn't really understand what was going on. Um, I remember being in, I think we were in Texas or something, like visiting family, because I remember watching the initial invasion on TV. But I, I didn't, you know, in, in the lead up to it, I didn't understand um, anything of what was going on. So I, I am kind of curious today to hear about, like, your perspective of, because when you go back and you see, like, the, you know, like the congressional hearings and stuff about it, it, it it is it, it was like the war in Iraq at least initially was had huge bipartisan support. Right. So I I don't know what percent I was with as far as people who weren't buying it, but I wasn't buying it. Right. I mean it, anymore. It's like you you go back and it's like was at least politicians today. It's like was Bernie Sanders the only one that was around back then that was like no this is bad because I mean it was it it really was both parties were were behind it. But again, I still think I wonder if that the Democratic support was maybe less about being convinced of the veracity of the claims and more about that was a smarter political move if the country is is with it. So we're just going to vote with they just going with the wind. You know what I'm just, saying? Yeah, it's not, to not wanting to right, right, not wanting to look weak or or not wanting to, yeah, especially at at a time you know it's it's two years, no, not right. even two years post nine eleven. So you know. If someone says, hey, we're going to go kill terrorists, it's like, all right, everyone's going to get behind that. And what's what's interesting, too, so I turned 18 in 96, but did not vote in 96, did not vote in 2000. I was kind of, at that point in my life, just of the opinion of, I actually have always been a believer of any one vote could swing an election. I didn't think it mattered who won the election. I just thought, whatever, it doesn't affect my life. Whoever wins, it doesn't change anything. And then the war in Iraq is actually what convinced me to register to vote and vote for the first time in 2004. Because I was like, oh, if Gore had won, we would not be in Iraq. So apparently it does make a difference. And apparently I need to start voting. I mean, if you look at it, for, I know it, that in America, the popular vote doesn't matter. But if you look at it from the popular vote, Gore did win. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, looking from today, looking back to 2003, when you see like... You know, the Colton Powell in front of the the UN basically, you know, setting out all the evidence of here's why we need to go into Iraq because of WMDs and so on and so forth. 
today looking back, it's like, okay, a lot of that was based on really flimsy evidence. And, you know, it was maybe probably not the right call. But at the time, what did people just believe it? Or just not care? Or I guess what is the because the, the justification now looking back obviously seems flimsy. And I don't know, I, I guess how does how, did, how was it at the time? So it, it was both. At the end of the day, it was already like, even if the, and actually this is, this is the other thing I was going to say, even if the evidence is soft, it's still in the best interest of the Iraqi people to get rid of Saddam Hussein. So even if we don't buy okay. the weapons of mass destruction, we're still liberating the Iraqi people. Okay. And, and that's what I was, so I get that. I'm not saying Saddam should have been in charge. I'm just saying the fact that they were trying to tie it was bad. And what you would see, too, in the immediate aftermath was, say, Iraqi refugees would be like, yeah, we don't like Saddam. But you know what we also liked? Normal, safe, daily lives, where if we towed the line, our families were safe. And we could go to work and go home and raise our families, and it was stable. And so basically, that's kind of the big thing is, yes, we didn't like Saddam, but we had stability and if you kind of talk about what what is the goal in life, and well, you know, and, and that was, I mean, you know, the the worst fears of all those people played out because right. as soon as now it's been twenty years of chaos, right? Because as soon as uh, Saddam Hussein is overthrown, then it's like immediate civil war, and oh, okay, like was Iraq or was Iraq not supporting terrorism, you know, before two thousand three? Definitely not afterwards, because then every you know, every jihadi in the world was like, oh, well, I want to go to Iraq because that's where the fight is. So, it, you know, and then you get the rise of the Islamic State uh, after that and combine that with the fact that the government that was set up by the United States was super corrupt and just, yeah. Right. And they even talked too about what kind of to your point with, you know, them making a concerted effort to make the connection. It, it, it's open now that in like 1998, these think tanks were basically saying, we think it would be a good thing to initiate regime change in Iraq. And they basically almost just like, and that was in 98. So it's just like constantly on the lookout for his excuse to swoop in there. Oh, 9-11? Perfect. Now we can do this plan we've been talking about, which is so ridiculous too when you think about it. It's like, yeah, because that went so well when we did that in Iran in the 50s. Let's do it again. Like, it's just the arrogance and ignorance combined. And again, obviously, I don't do that kind of stuff for a living, but it's just a lack of foresight and the idea like, oh, we figured everything would be okay once Saddam was gone. It's like, what made you think that? What what evidence do you have of anything like that ever working in history? It's basically the same arrogance the Brits had when they divided everything up in the first place 100 years earlier. Yeah. And it's frustrating and you feel so bad for the Iraqi people. And this is also, it, this conflict kind of, at least in, in certain ways, is kind of similar to the Rwandan civil war that we mm. talked about, where you have a a minority class suppressing the majority. Okay. So Saddam Hussein is, you know, he's part of this Sunni minority. The Ba'ath Party or whatever. Yeah, but he, so he and his, and his homies were, they were a, a Sunni minority that were suppressing a Shia majority. So then when he got overthrown, well, now, now it's flipped. Now you have the majority suppressing the, the right. uh, majority Shia suppressing the, the Sunnis that are, that were their oppressors for so long. It's kind of like a, the Tutsis and the Hutus. Yeah, similar to what you, you think about South, South Africa and then how important it was that Mandela immediately was preaching nope it's in the past and there will be no kind of retaliation for years of oppression we're moving on the end and there was like okay you're the boss because they just kind of worshiped mandela in a way that kind of helped prevent south africa from going down that same road that's what ended up happening in rwanda that kind of let them get out of that was they they kind of were like all right we've done this for so long we're just going to all be rwandans now right so to our film today, we're basically now in this was about the second year of the war in Iraq. So Saddam has been overthrown, but now the United States military presence and some of its allies are just trying to stabilize the country with all these insurgents. And specifically, it basically says we are in 2004 in Baghdad. And just a, a quick, I mean, I'm not going to, you know, hash out I, Iraqi history here, but just a reminder that Iraq is basically built on 
Mesopotamia. If you think back to, you know, grade school world history, yeah. where you're first learning about the cradle of civilization between the two rivers, that's Iraq. But even like the whole, you know, uh, wonders of the world, the hanging gardens also was kind of a, a Babylon thing. And, you know, Alexander the Great died in, well, Babylon, which again, is still kind of roughly this area. And then, you know, the, it was under Ottoman control and just a million different other people have been in control of this area before it kind of became Iraq following World War One and World War Two and wasn't democratic until well in theory after the fall of saddam but again there's just been so much dealing with insurgency and corruption that it's still just not under control today but yes so we are in 2004 and just kind of watching soldiers deal with the chaos in baghdad and specifically our main characters in the hurt locker are basically it's a bomb disposal unit so if someone sees something they're the bomb techs that get called in Right. And uh, I just kind of want to get this out of the way at the beginning that I I understand that, like, from a purely filmmaking point of view, this is a good movie. It won Best Picture. The performances are good. It's it's well paced. It's it's well shot. It's well edited. Sure. However, the inaccuracies and the ridiculousness and the silliness like of how military life is or of what? how military life is and how military life was in Iraq at the time. It's like, at least for me personally, it's enough to take me out of it. Like it, it just kills my suspension of disbelief. Interesting. So I like, I can't, I can't watch the movie without rolling my eyes through the whole thing. And I, I really want to like it because I, I know that it's, it's a best picture winner. I it's, if I didn't know anything about the military or how it, how it worked or what they were doing in Iraq, like, I would probably like it. Right. Any, anything you're an expert on becomes hard to watch. Like my, my big thing is anytime anybody runs in a movie and they are not going at a pace that, that corresponds to their level of fatigue after having ran that pace for a certain duration, I'm like ridiculous. Like it's just like, yeah. I'm like, nope, you can't run yeah. that. They, they may look like you're running that pace for three minutes and they're not even out of breath. Like they couldn't even hold it, let alone not be out of breath, and it's just anyway. It's right, just... and and I, obviously, so I I was never in EOD. Like I, I'm sure for for guys that were actually, you know, explosive ordnance disposal guys, I, I, I'm sure it's even worse. Right. For dudes like that watching this movie, but even stuff like, and when you look at like the cover of the movie, or at least the the picture that they have on like the the Wikipedia page, it's one of the you know more famous shots of the movie where he's like pulling up all the wires. Yes. And all the shells come out of the ground. To me, that's that's like a really condensed version of what I'm talking about because number one, you would never do that. I do think it was odd. It's like, why is he pulling on the wires? <laughs> yeah, and number two, uh, in that scene, those dudes are just rolling around by themselves, which would never happen. EOD is like they are always with somebody. They're never just. It's never just three dudes in a in a Humvee driving around and finding stuff to go disarm. Oh, I thought they always had kind of like uh, they had people kind of cordoning off the area for them. I thought. Yeah, sometimes, but then there's other times where they're just out hanging out by themselves, I like when you. they're with the Brits. So they're, and then also in that shot, it's like, I don't know what, like six or seven, roughly half a dozen of these, you know, artillery shells. Those things are like over 90 pounds of pop. Oh, I didn't think about that. So just like, one hand pulls them up out of the ground. He's basically doing a one-handed 500-pound deadlift. <laughs> I never thought about that. That's interesting. No, it is kind of funny. Just when you... It's it's the Dunning Kruger thing. I didn't know what I didn't know about you know the realities of right. of this. That's interesting. So I don't want to cut you short because I do think it's important, and ultimately that's even what this podcast is about is kind of pointing out those things. But if <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and yeah. get to the movie, <laughs> yeah, and I'm not going to go through and, and point out every single inconsistency. I'm just right. saying that that's the kind of stuff that takes me out of it. Just like one more example, and I probably oh, no, that's fine. that's fine. When they when they're in the barracks room or whatever and they're drunk and they're oh yeah going through all the box of bomb parts or whatever yeah of ieds that he's disarmed this is another thing where like in the story like it shows you know that he's like holding on it's like a a a visual representation of all the stuff that he's holding on to about all these deployments that he's been on but like you would never just keep a piece of an ied like that stuff all goes to be analyzed and inspected and it's like evidence of a crime it would be like if uh, they made a detective movie and he had like all these murder weapons in a crate under his bed and he's like, oh, this is a symbols of all the cases that I've worked. It's like, dude, what are you doing? Like, that's evidence that could help us catch the people that did the crime. Oh, right, right. <laughs> Why do you have this crate of 
murder weapons. What are you doing? <laughs> so just two examples of things that are completely ridiculous and why I, it's it's hard for me to like the movie, even though I know that it's good. OK, no. And that's that's totally fair. I, I get that. So, yeah, we start off and they, they could do a good cold open where you kind of see well, it's probably not exactly a cold open, but they, they do a good prologue kind of opening where you haven't yet met the main character and the bomb team, which I had forgotten, it's Anthony Mackie as like the co-lead in this movie. Yep, Anthony Mackie and and Guy Pierce, yeah, right. who I think is criminally underutilized in Hollywood. Hundred percent agree. Huge fan. I love Guy Pierce. He's great in everything. And so yeah, they, they're trying to get a bomber control. They're using the robot. He puts on the suit. Yeah, and ultimately they're basically there's a a guy using a cell phone to remote detonate it when Guy Pierce is too close. Oh, it's interesting, though, too, because they're talking about the safe range, and he's wearing this suit that's supposed to re- provide some protection, and how did he not live? He, he, he was over 75 meters, I thought, from that blast when it when it went off, and he still had the suit on, and then all of a sudden, he gets hit in the back, he's away from the explosion, and, like, his just face shield goes blood. Like, it just didn't, that didn't seem realistic to right, me, either. because it's, it's not the, like, shrapnel or whatever oh, true. that killed it's, him. It's, it's the, oof. It's the shock wave. It's, over, it's the overpressure. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah. That makes sense. Almost like how if you fall onto the ocean, the surface tension can kill you. I mean, it's not the same thing, but as far as something that doesn't seem fatal yeah. being fatal, that just the right. air being pushed that far and the pressure changing that much basically just crushes you or whatever. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, that's right. interesting. Yeah. Um, and then the, the replacement for Guy Pierce's role on the team is Jeremy Renner, and this is basically his breakout film no one had heard it well you know what i'm saying but most people had not heard of jeremy renner before this obviously it's it's a big production it's a and it you know won academy awards but like i don't know if you if i think it might be too expensive almost to make this movie today because jeremy renner's a huge star oh, Anthony right. mackie's a lot bigger because he right. was in like you know the marvel movies and stuff um ralph fines obviously he's been around since forever but he's, you know, he's role, though, like yeah, a, yeah. basically a cameo yeah david right. morris guy pierce like this is a pretty stacked cast yeah and that's one of the other things, like, I the really want to like this movie. Yeah. I, yes, because the performances are actually pretty good. Basically, if they had just done a little better job on getting some of these things accurate that were, there's no reason to make these mistakes. Like, you can do the same movie, change a few things, and just yeah. make it that much more more accurate. And that's, again, I, I've definitely had similar frustrations on on other projects. But yeah, so basically, it's just kind of them going, there's the countdown of how many days they have left, and it's just kind of all these different things they get called in on where they're trying to defuse these bombs in these tense situations and each one goes slightly different. But then it also definitely has heavy themes of what I wrote down was confusion that it's trying to illustrate yeah. the chaotic nature of this conflict and probably also the futility of it through right. the confusion. We, we like when he's convinced that the kid he's kind of developed a relationship with has been killed and turned into a bomb. And then later mm-hmm. sees that kid and realizes he was yeah. wrong, and but again, it just kind of speaks to even when you're certain about something and, over there, you're wrong. And the the stuff when you know when they're out and uh, there's the scene where I, I forget if it's if it's the first scene or a, a subsequent scene, but the the youngest guy has his gun pointed at a guy with a cell phone, and Anthony Mackie's yelling at him to shoot him, and he's like, I don't know what to do, I don't know what to do, because he's, I mean, he is just a guy with a cell phone, but right it's impossible to know right you're gonna and kill a guy like, with a well, cell phone just in case right do i kill an innocent guy just in case if i don't do anything you know what's the outcome of that like how am i gonna live with myself if something happens to my friend like which also is what causes him so much grief after the fact where he keeps kind of saying like he's dead click he's alive as far as if i pull the trigger or not he would be alive or not yeah so this film does not follow any specific historical figures or actual soldiers. It's actually kind of an amalgamation written by screenwriter Mark Bowles, who was over there, talked to a hundred or so soldiers, and just kind of made this movie based on a lot of basically anecdotes he was hearing and things he was hearing. And, you know, and so I don't know yeah. how much he even made up. He was just kind of pull, pulling it from different people. Because pr- prior to screenwriting, he was he was like a journalist. Yes, yes, he wasn't he wasn't always a screenwriter. 
Right. So that's what that's because we kind of had this access as a journalist. Yes. And then wrote, wrote the screenplay to the point that it actually ended up being they actually ended up getting sued when the movie was successful because one guy in particular thought that there was things that were, hey, these are actual stories I told Mark. And now you're winning Best oh, Picture and really? making million dollars, uh, on, millions of dollars on this movie. And where's my cut? Now, he ultimately lost his lawsuit because there was some things that like, well, I mean, other people had similar stories and everything was changed just enough. And this guy even tried to claim that he invented the term Hurt Locker. But it says online here that like, well, no, that that term goes back even to Vietnam. And it just kind of basically says, you know, if someone gets hurt, they go to the Hurt Locker. Like or you're, you're injured someone, you send them to the Hurt Locker. It's kind of the way I understand that. So that claim was really kind of shot down from this guy. And 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 also too, they talk about you're not telling these people a certain soldier's life story. So as far as like Mark's right to write what he kind of witnesses and hears, he pretty much has carte blanche as long as he's not basically straight up telling the life story of someone else. You think back to like you know talk about a Citizen Kane where William Randolph Hearst got mad at Orson Welles, and ultimately Welles didn't really get in trouble, and that was very heavily based on, and he still got away with it because he changed enough. So there was kind of mm-hmm. no way this lawsuit was gonna hold water, but it was a yeah. little controversial at the at the time. Well, even something like uh, well. I don't know exactly how much it's based on, but isn't uh, was a wedding story? With Noah Baumbach and um, was it Jennifer Jason Lee that yeah, he was married that, to? Oh, I think that's right. Yeah, and it was like kind of. I mean, it, it was it was like an amalgamation of of a lot of different people's divorce experiences, but that was like one of the big ones. Was right, right. Now that's different his. because he's basically it's his own story. You have the right to your own story. Right, right. So, it, yeah, it was yeah. his own story. I'm just saying it's that's another one where it's very heavily based on correct. And so, yes, the film itself did win Best Picture and, very important historically, Catherine Bigelow won Best Director and remains the only female director to ever win the Oscar for Best Director. And it won a total of six Academy Awards, was nominated for three others. So Jeremy Renner was the only acting nomination, but man, I think Anthony Mackie was man every bit as good and i'm surprised he didn't get a supporting actor nomination and i guess i almost yeah. feel like it's the, maybe the the angst we do see renner's character going through a little more of that that angst but but yeah. still i think Mac, mackie was you know kind of given maybe not even a too over too big performance but it was it was it was good i, I was very impressed with mackie and I, I i couldn't believe i didn't realize it was him because i didn't know neither of, i didn't know either of them when i first watched this film in the theaters but I guess when they kind of popped later, I think it's because Renner kind of got some bigger jobs right away. And it was a while mm-hmm. before I saw Mackie and enough other stuff to say, it takes you a few movies to kind of get used to these new actors that kind of break. And then, so it was by the time I, you know, Mackie was in Avengers and I knew him name with a face. I had forgotten that he was also the Hurt Locker guy versus Renner kind of rolls right into some projects. And I was like, Oh yeah. And he got the Oscar nomination. So he just, he just kind of got bigger a little quicker. And then on Rotten Tomatoes, it is a 97%, so that 3% must be soldiers who became critics. <laughs> 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 um, and then 84% on the audience side could, could speak to some of that as well, as far as those things, just kind of, those little annoyances kind of driving people crazy. Yeah, one of the quotes in the opening text of the film talks about war being a drug, or war is a drug. And we definitely see throughout that Renner's character almost does seem to be doing it for the rush almost it's almost like comically how comic how overt they are with it like when he he uh defuses the bomb and then immediately smokes a cigarette like he just got done having sex like it's it like yeah. that's not that's not subtle at all that's straight up what they're paralleling and right his team members get mad at him for basically even call him out for your adrenaline seeking is gonna get us killed and is causing all these problems so yeah the whole war is a drug thing and then the fact that when he goes home he just can't even function in normal life and wants to go back because yeah. that's the only thing he actually tells his son and who's too young to even understand it's an infant. But basically as you get older, the things you love get fewer and fewer. And I I think there's only one thing left that I love. And that's not an exact quote, but that's basically the thought. And then they cut from that to him going back to Iraq and that the only thing he loves in the world is diffusing bombs. And you think about him basically, it's almost like he's a heroin addict then like he wants nothing more than his next fix and you just can't wait to get out there. Yeah, and I think that that does happen kind of to an extent in real life too, but another big component of that, you know, just 
going back over and over again is it's like a you know seeking a sense of purpose oh yes N- not necessarily just the adrenaline junkie part but right. just like having a my purpose, life matters you know life yeah. life right and and life is simpler like i just i do this and this and this and i'll live to the next day which you you kind of see when in the um like the grocery store supermarket scene where it's like you know he he's going through he's standing there in the in the like aisle with all the cereal yes. and you can kind of see on his face is like what am i doing here like what what has my life become like i'm so bored <laughs> i also saw that as being overwhelmed by those choices and it's harder to make those choices than it is to make choices in combat i saw it kind of as even right. that too yeah for and, sure yeah and oh and uh, evangeline lily plays his wife who i don't think i knew that either because i don't think i've seen this since i saw lost so it was kind of interesting going back and like, oh, freckles. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so yes, great movie. Take it with a grain of salt, I guess, as far as how mili- life in the military actually is. But next week, we'll take a break from the war on terror and deal with an issue that sadly affects approximately 5% of women in the world in the film Moolah that deals with female genital mutilation in Africa. <laughs> 